Worship Church today. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're gonna sing together. If you're with us online. Welcome, you're in the right place. Go ahead, turn up that volume. We're gonna sing together. All the words will be on the screen for you. Come on, let's sing it out together today. Here we go. That brings me a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Come on, let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing, we sing your name in the dark, and it changes everything. We sing with all we are, we claim your victory. That's right. Let it. voices and raise your hands. Wow. Man, you guys sound amazing today. My name is Cameron and I'm here with Lisa and we just wanted to take a moment to welcome everyone for joining us for church. Everyone that's in the room right now and everyone that's watching online. That's right. You can give it up for yourselves. That's right. We are so excited that each and every one of you are with us today. Whether you've been coming for a day or a decade, you are in the right yes. place. Welcome home. You belong here. And we do want to take just a moment and give a special shout out to anybody who's maybe joining us for the first time or you're new to City First. You are our honored guest. And because of that, we have a special gift just for you. 
That's right, after service, you can make your way out into the lobby at the Next Step booth. We have a gift that's just for you. It's our way of saying thank you for checking out our church and being a part of the City First family. That's right, so church, one more time. Can we give it up for all of our first time guests? We're so glad that you're here today at City First. We're so expectant for what God is gonna do today. And I just wanna take a moment, we're gonna continue in our time of worship. And maybe you're brand new to City First, or maybe you're brand new to being a part of any church. And during worship, you're seeing people with their hands raised, and you're wondering, do these people have a question or what's going on here? And I just wanna say that if we think about it, oftentimes people raise their hands as an outward expression of an inward position. You know, you think about your favorite sports team and if they win the big game, your arms go up celebrating their victory. Or maybe you think about when you're stressed out and you're going, I'm just not sure what to do anymore. You might throw your hands up in a place of surrender. Or I think about when my boys were little and they couldn't quite talk yet, but they could kind of walk. And if their dad walked in the room, their hands would go up excited to be in the presence of their father, or maybe they wanted their dad to carry them, their hands would go up. And so today, as we're worshiping, I'm praying that our hearts would be set into an inward position of focusing in on Jesus. Jesus who gives us victory, Jesus who carries us, Jesus who gives us peace, Jesus who we get to be in his presence this morning. He's worthy of our worship, our time, our attention and devotion. So let's go ahead and let's worship him.
one? Do you know that the same one we're singing about is a God who is greater, who is stronger, who is higher than anything you may go through? And we know that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, he brings hope, he brings peace, he brings clarity to every situation. So come on, as we continue, can we have confidence and sing this together today? Oh, we pray to Jesus, see right God, today we just stand in awe of you. Lord, we're so thankful for your presence. God, that as we sing lyrics about who you are, about your character, God, that we can be reminded that you have been with us each and every day, that your faithfulness has not wavered, that your consistency has not changed. Lord, we thank you for the victories. We praise you through the battles. God, we know that you're with us each and every step that we take. We love you in this place today. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, can we thank him for who he is? He's a faithful God, never changing. It's good. Amen. Well, thanks so much for singing with us. You can go ahead and have a seat today. If you're with us online, welcome. You're in the right place. And hey, at the end of this week, we have something very exciting happening for all of the ladies in the house.
That's right, Original Conference is just a few days away. So to learn more about it and all that's planned, let's check this out together. 24 hours can change a lot. If you've never heard about Original, it is not just a conference, it's an encounter. This is a girls weekend with a God purpose, an unforgettable time with Jesus, and a movement of women discovering the confidence to walk in who God has designed them to be. And here's what I know, when we get a change of our everyday space in our normal pace, we will experience a change in our perspective. So gather your girlfriends and let's set aside time to learn, to worship, grow, and to laugh together. I believe with all my heart that God is going to meet us in a powerful way, and we will walk away encouraged and filled and challenged and refreshed and new, all because of Jesus. You know, the original weekend, it's not gonna be the same without you. So we're saving you a seat at Original Conference 2023. All right. That is coming up. For those of you who are in the room, when you walked in the lobby, you could tell the girls have taken over already, okay? We are gonna have an incredible time. Original starts this Friday night at 7 p.m. and goes all day Saturday until 5 p.m. And I just want to invite each and every lady within the sound of my voice, whether you're in the room or online, um, that you're personally invited, okay? Pretend like we're sitting at Starbucks right now and I am personally inviting you to conference. It will not be the same without you. Listen, we have a $20 off code just for today until midnight, so you can go online and register. You can stop by the original booth and register, um, but it will not be the same without you. Would love to have you join us. It will be a weekend to remember for sure, so hope to see you there. Well, this is the part of the service where each and every time that we gather, we give people an opportunity to give back to God through giving to City First Church. And to participate in the giving today, you're going to see that there's ways listed on the screen that you're able to give. And if you are in the room and you have a physical gift, like you're like me, you still write a check sometimes, um, there are offering boxes at the doors and you can use those on your way out after service is dismissed. But as you are preparing your gifts, I want to just share some pretty exciting news. You know, we have two of our locations at City First are in correctional facilities. One in at Dixon Correctional Center in uh, Dixon, Illinois, and then the other one at Hardy Correctional Center down in Hardy County, Florida. And our amazing Cape Coral crew, they, um, they have a team each and every week that goes to Hardy and runs services. Well, just yesterday, Hardy had their their Easter services, and I am so excited to report that yesterday they had incredible attendance and 35 inmates made the decision to make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of their life. Incredible, incredible. And something else really special happened is that yesterday they were able to have baptisms and 18 inmates were water baptized yesterday at Hardy. Incredible, and our location pastor who goes each and every week to Hardy said it was a day that he will never forget because that's how special it was and that God moved in such an incredible way. And, and you know, in two weeks, April 30th, we are actually going to have a baptism celebration here. Those are some of our favorite Sundays here at City First Church. And I know that there's so many people that gave their lives to Jesus at Easter, or maybe you've been coming around here for a while and you've never taken that next step of water baptism. We just want to encourage you. It is, it, it, what, being water baptized is an outward expression of the inward decision that you've made, that you're saying, my old life is gone, and I am turning now, and I am following Jesus, and you're letting the world know, this Jesus, I'm following you for the rest of my days, and so if that is something you would like to be a part of, we would highly encourage you to do that. You can sign up. There's a couple booths out in the lobby. There's ways that you can sign up online, and we'll answer any questions you have, but if there's even a part of you that's like, I'm going to look into that, do it. We encourage you. Trust me, there will be... It's just a party around here. How many of you, Baptism Sundays are some of your favorite. They're so, so incredible. So hope you guys will join us for that. Let me pray and bless our gifts and we'll continue in our service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what we get to be a part of. Thank you for what you did at Hardy yesterday. Thank you for the lives that are changing. God, thank you 
that you love us so much. God, that you are up to something pretty special around this place, and it is our joy to partner with you as we give. So bless each gift and each giver in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's give cheerfully today. City First Church is one church with multiple locations. Hello to our online location, City First Anywhere, and everyone joining us at God Behind Bars. And to everyone in a seat at our Spring Creek and Cape Coral locations, we're so glad you're here. It's our vision to see cities full of hope and people full of purpose. With that being said, let's check out what's coming up. Growth Track is designed for you to discover your God-given purpose. It starts the first Sunday of every month, in person or online. To sign up, visit cityfirst.church forward slash growth track. Baptism Sunday is April 30th. If you recently made Jesus the leader and forgiver of your life and want to take the next step in your faith, simply visit the app or cityfirst.church forward slash baptism. Christian Life Schools offers a Christ-centered education for students, pre-K through 12th grade. Mark your calendars for the next open house on Saturday, May 6th. For more information or to RSVP, visit clsschools.org. Special guest Michelle Williams of Destiny's Child will be with us on Sunday, May 7th. We will be kicking off our new series, Peace of Mind, with a conversation around mental health. Stay updated on all things City First by visiting the City First app and following us on social media. Finally, if you have a small child in service, please utilize our family room or mother's room designed for you to enjoy service with your child. Today, we start a brand new series, Love Songs and Lies, Volume 2. We're talking all about relationships and how God designed them to be. And who does a love song better than the boy band? I have no words. I have no words. <laughs> All right, let's just be honest. We're in church right now, which means that we need to be honest. How many of you at one point were a boy band fan? Come on, raise your hands. Yep, yep, awesome, yep. My hand is not up on that, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> 
Well, we begin a brand new series today. Um, it's a relationship series called Love Songs and Lies. We did it actually last year. And uh, people loved it so much, they actually requested we do it again. Because what we're talking about is we're talking about relationships. And the sermon is not just for married people or people that are in romantic relationships. But it's actually for all relationships. Because the Word of God has wisdom for every kind of relationship that you have in your life. And in the room today, there are all kinds of people, as well as watching online right now at our locations, uh, even, you know, right now in your living room, there are all kinds of, you know, different types of relational statuses, like there is married, there's not married, there's previously married, there's widowed, and there's all kinds of other things in between. And the series is really going to be focusing on uh, relationships in general. Now today I am going to focus more on like romantic relationships, but I promise you this, if you take these thoughts, these principles from the Word of God, you can actually apply them to any relationship you have. In fact, uh, it has been said this, it's been said that relationships are the stuff life is made of, all right? It's really important to understand without relationships you really don't have life. I mean, really, we're all in some sort of relationship uh, with coworkers, romantic relationships with people, maybe, or a person, uh, friendships, uh, even relationships like in your neighborhood and things like that. And I believe that the former president, Theodore Roosevelt, said it best when he said, the most important single ingredient in the formula of success in life is knowing how to get along with people. It's really true. It's really true. Now, I know some of you are like going, well, I'm introverted. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Your success is going to be dependent on how well you get along with people. I'm not saying you have to become extroverted. I'm not saying that you have to get on a stage or you have to, you know, be a public speaker or whatever else. No, it's not about your personality. What I'm talking about and what that quote from Theodore Roosevelt is talking about is that you have to learn how to relate with other people because it's not what you know, it's what? Who you know, right? It's the connection you have with other people. There are two things we must deal with our whole life, all right? Now, if you're thinking the Benjamin Franklin quote, it'd be death and taxes. But I would say this. The two things you will always deal with in life are relationships and money. And only one of them will make you truly rich. Hear what I'm saying here? Only one of them will make you truly rich. And today, I'm going to focus, like I said, more on romantic relationships, but again, apply these truths to any relationship. Every generation has its love songs. Every one. I grew up in the 80s, uh, so therefore, the uh, lyrical geniuses who are the experts on, on romantic relationships usually wore spandex and used a lot of Aquanet hairspray. All right? <laughs> But whatever generation you grew up in, there were love songs that became a part of framing the romantic relationships in your life. Maybe you grew up with Elvis. Uh, maybe you grew up with the Beatles, Marvin Gaye, right? Or Journey, or Van Halen, or Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, NSYNC, Celine Dion, Boys to Men, come on. Or Coldplay, Taylor Swift, Keith Urban, Usher, Justin Timberlake, Beyonce, Carrie Underwood with her bat, all right? Uh, Adele, One Direction, Drake, Justin Bieber, The Biebs, Dua Lipa, or even Lainey Wilson more, com more recently. I will tell you one of these, one common thread throughout all of the generations, regardless of who you listen to growing up, is this, everyone wants to have life-giving relationships. I don't know anybody who's like, I want to have life-sucking relationships, right? Everyone wants life-giving relationships. We want to be loved, we want to be understood, and we want to find a person that we can trust and do life with. The problem is, most people... They run into this, this, this uh, lie or they, they run into this dilemma where they think that chemistry with someone is all that they need. But they don't understand that's just the beginning. Chemistry doesn't give you lasting love. Chemistry doesn't give you a life-giving marriage. And chemistry doesn't work in the long haul. In fact, I say chemistry is just the beginning of the story. 
Chemistry is just the beginning. Now, listen, chemistry is important. Hopefully you have chemistry your whole relationship. But I'm telling you, it's only, if it's only chemistry, it's only like having one wing on an airplane. It ain't going to fly. People think that it's the feelings and the passion that work long haul, but it's actually more than that. It's more than chemistry. It also requires the other wing, commitment, all right? And beyond chemistry, there must be a relationship that is full of commitment. Relationships uh, require a lot of hard work. Anybody who's been married or in a relationship for a long time, you know that, right? It, it requires a lot of right choices, and many people think it's just the chemistry, it's just the passion, it's just the sex. But here's the fact. The fact is, chemistry only takes you so far, a relationship based on commitment will carry you the distance, all right? Will carry you the distance. So how do you do this? How do you build a relationship with commitment, how do you build a relationship of longevity that will carry you the distance? And most importantly, how do you do it God's way? Because relationships done God's way are successful. They tend to go the distance. And so we're going to talk about that today. About 10 years ago, um, Jen and I were actually on a dinner cruise. I think it might have been the only dinner cruise we've ever been on. Uh, we were on a dinner cruise with our good friends, Steve and Charlotte Gamble. And we were on this dinner cruise. It was this big, long boat. And it, it was like a restaurant on the inside. It had tables. And we were right at the bow, right at the very front of the boat. We had this, like, round table there. And there was this glass, like, canopy over us. And we're cruising down the river at night and all the lights of the river. Like, it was amazing. There was a small band, like a three-piece band that was playing music. And I am definitely going to get the Husband of the Year Award. I'm telling you right now. I mean, I'm looking at Jen going, is this too much? Is it too much? I mean, really, you know, I mean, uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to get the, the husband of the year award. Well, then all of a sudden, right in the middle of like when dinner is being served, uh, again, it's kind of like tables all over the front of this like boat. And all of a sudden, this like older couple, they're probably in their late 70s, just all of a sudden got up. They left their dinner. They got up and they started dancing in between the tables to the music. And I'm thinking, stink, he's going to get the husband of the year award now. <laughs> right? I mean, literally, they're just dancing. And, I, I mean, they were pushing 80, literally. They're, they were very, you know, they're kind of older. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, here is this amazing moment. And the whole, like, dining room area, that part of the boat just stopped. We stopped eating and we just watched. And we're watching this older couple that you could just tell the way they're looking at each other the way that they were dancing, I mean, they were really in love. Now, this is what everyone was thinking at that moment. Like all of us that were sitting at our tables watching, we were thinking this, how do we have that at that age? How do we do that? How do we do that? Because we want that. I think that's really, you know, movies Movies and music always push chemistry, but, but we wanted not just chemistry, we wanted that. Like, that's commitment, that's deep love. There was something there we were like, all of us were thinking that, you know? And, um, and I'll tell you that we are, as individuals, we're designed for relationship, not just chemistry. The hookup culture, what happens a lot of times on Friday and Saturday nights and things like that around our nation and bars and clubs and places all over the place, a lot of it is based on chemistry. But really what we're designed for is we're designed for commitment and relationship. Now, if you think your relationship is going to look like the movie The Notebook, all right, some of you are too young to remember that, that movie, but you know, you're probably going to be slightly underwhelmed. Because I don't know any marriage that looks like that, you know. But we always need to remember that, uh, that God designed us for more than just the chemistry. Chemistry is important. Don't hear me as saying it's not important. It needs to be there. But it's more than that. In fact, I've noticed something in um, the 27 years that Jen and I have been married that not only is chemistry important, but actually commitment many times is forged in, and I know this is going to sound anticlimactic, but um, it's forged in hardship. 
I feel like sometimes that actually the deeper the relationship is, is because the deeper of, of the journey that the two people have had to go through, it's actually sometimes the hardship that bonds people together. In crisis, we tend to, as people, we tend to reach up to God and reach out to others. And that's not just romantic, that's like friendships, those people around us. When you're going through a crisis, what do you do? You reach up, God help, and you reach out, People come close. I need my person. I need my people to be with me. And this goes back to Genesis, by the way. Like literally the beginning of time when God created the earth, all right, and he created us. It says this in Genesis chapter 2. It is not good for the man to be alone, God said. And every woman said, yep, that's right. Okay, all right. Because otherwise he ain't going to do the dishes and he won't be able to get his laundry done. Okay, whatever. It's not good for a man to be alone. And uh, what really is interesting here is this is before sin entered the world. Do you ever think about that? Before sin entered the world, before, you know, Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and all that kind of stuff, before pain, before there was this, this deep need that we have now, uh, before any of that, God said in the perfect Eden and in the perfect world that was not tainted by sin, something was not good. And he said, aloneness was not good. Isn't that interesting? And so he created Eve. Now, no one wants to really be alone. Now, there are times that we want to be left alone. Can I get an amen on that, right? Okay. It's like, leave me alone a little bit. Talk to somebody even just, you know, uh, just a few moments ago uh, before the service started. And, and she's like, I, I'm kind of an introvert, and she was like a key player here in making the Easter services happen. And I said, what would you do yesterday? And she goes, I didn't talk to anybody. It was glorious. <laughs> All right, uh, sometimes, that's okay, that's okay. But we don't want, there's a difference between being left alone versus being alone. And we don't want to be alone. That's why many times solitary confinement is, is the worst form of punishment, you know, it's because you want to be around other people, whether it be a, a romantic relationship, whether it be friendships, whether it be family or whatever else. You see, you can have chemistry with someone romantically, but you can still be alone. Because chemistry alone makes you feel alone. You need to have someone who's also saying, I'm committed to you. It's not just based on chemistry and feelings. I'm committed to you. And when you find that committed kind of relationship, then you find yourself you're no longer alone. When you truly make God the center of your relational decision making, then you feel safe, both people feel safe, and they feel taken care of. So the inference here is that God needs to be in the middle of each person's life. So when you come together in a romantic relationship, God is already the center. God is the primary relationship for each individual. And then together, the decision-making is based around a relationship with God. You know, it, it, it really, one of the beautiful parts about a Christian relationship is that you pray for one another. You pray for one another. This is something that people that maybe don't have faith or, or they don't, you know, put faith at the center of their relationships, maybe, maybe they don't pray. And I will tell you if, you, if you put God at the center of your personal relationship and then each other, guess what? You begin to pray for one another. And it says here in Luke chapter 22, um, Jesus is sp speaking to, to Simon Peter. And at this point, you know, uh, his, name, his name is Simon, and, and it says this, Simon, Simon, Jesus says, Satan has asked to sift each of you, meaning the disciples, like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. Here's the God of the universe looking at Simon, who was, later on his name will be changed to Peter, that's why I call him Simon Peter, um, and, and he's saying, the God of the universe is saying, Simon, I'm praying for you. How, how, do you think, how do you think he felt at that moment? Simon Peter probably felt like, wow, I got Jesus praying for me. When someone prays for you, it's the best affirmation you can give them. Because when you pray, you are acknowledging that person's value. 
All right? You are acknowledging that person's value. Like, like I had somebody yesterday, two days ago, actually, at Walgreens. At Walgreens. I'm, I'm coming out of Walgreens, and this guy stops me, and he goes, hey, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer today. Will you pray for him? I said, absolutely. What's his name? I got his name, and I put it on my little prayer list. And you know what? When you pray for somebody, it's affirming their value. Never in my entire life have I had anybody ever turn me down if I asked if I could pray for them. Never. I mean, doesn't matter if they're Christ followers or not. Why? Because deep down on the inside, we sense that maybe God is part of the answer to the problem, right? And also, also, by me offering to pray, I am assigning a sense of value onto that person. Who doesn't want to be valued, right? We all do. See, when you pray for that other person, when you pray for your spouse, when you pray for your boyfriend, your girlfriend, when you even pray for your friend, your coworker, you are assigning value. It's more than just a greeting. Hey, how you doing? Right? That's how we greet each other in America now. Hey, how you doing? Now, we're not really, that, that's really like saying hi. We're not really wanting an answer, right? But really when you pray for somebody, what you're saying is, I'm going to go beyond a greeting. I'm going to go beyond this kind of cordial kind of friendship or relationship we have. I'm going to go deeper than that. I want to know, what can I pray for you for? And at that moment, you're assigning value and you're showing that other person that you care. So let me ask this, for those of us especially that are in a romantic relationship, do you pray for your partner often? Do you do that? And you're kind of maybe, if you're like me, sometimes you're like, oh man, I need to do that more. Okay, today is a day to start doing that. I know for a fact that my wife prays for me a lot. Jen prays for me a lot. In fact, on Sunday mornings, many times she will be up before me. We both get up very early. Uh, we get to this campus very early um, to prepare for everything that's going to take place with all the services at City First, not just here but, but around uh, globally. And we pray about it. But here's the thing. She gets up before me and Jen... Um, she'll go out into, you know, the living room and the kitchen area, and, and uh, I'll many times find her praying for me, praying that God would anoint me when I get up on this stage. You see, do you pray for your person, whoever that is? They're going to work. Do you pray that God gives them strength? Doesn't mean you have to, you don't have to spend hours, okay? It could be minutes, but you pray. You pray with that person, about their work day. You pray as they're parenting. You pray as they have that challenge, whatever it is. Because also, when you speak words of life, you create life. Do you understand that? When you speak words of life, you create life in that other person. It's really true. Words are powerful, both good and bad. But words are very powerful. And sometimes I realize it's hard to speak positively about the person you know oh so well, right? Why? Because you see the good, you see the bad, and you see the ugly. You see everything, right? Sometimes it's hard because you see people's flaws. But they see your flaws too. <laughs> Remember that. Like I always say, relationships would be so easy if people weren't involved. Words matter. In fact, in Romans chapter 10, it says, faith comes by hearing. By hearing, hearing the word. Not just the word of God, but hearing other words. That's why some of you, maybe you're in a relationship. You're, let's, let's say you're in a dating relationship or whatever, or maybe in a friendship group or whatever, and you're in kind of a wrong relationship because all that other person is doing is speaking negativity over you. And you know what that's building? That's building a negative faith because words build something inside of us. They construct worldviews. They construct mindsets. They construct either strengths or insecurities. And you have a person who's always looking at you going, you're a moron, you're a failure. Why did you do this? Can I tell you something? You need to find someone who's going to speak better words. I would even say this as a little disclaimer, by the way. If for any reason you are in an abusive relationship, like you are in physical danger, you need to get out of that relationship today because God never wants you to be in a relationship where you're physically being in danger or punished. 
But back to words. We can speak words of creation or we can speak words of criticism tearing each other down. And we need to be people who speak words of creation and words of life. We need to hear hope. We need to feel valued. We need to know that we can do it and that we can overcome. Jesus looked at Simon and said, I'm praying for you. And eventually Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter. Peter is translated rock or boulder. Where in other words he's saying you are a rock. You are a firm foundation. You are a cornerstone. You are a boulder that can be built upon. Later on, later on Jesus launches the church through Peter. And so it's kind of interesting that Jesus is calling Peter a rock on which he builds the church. You see, Peter did not deserve that title yet. This is very important. Jesus changed his name to Peter. Peter would eventually deny Jesus three times during the Easter story like we talked about last week. Peter was kind of a moron. I mean, really, honestly. He was a little hot-headed. It would have been hard to be friends with Peter. It would have been hard to be married to Peter. Um, and, and Peter, we believe, was married, actually, and that he had a daughter that, uh, that was disabled. I mean, this is stuff that historians talk about, that, that he had a family and everything. Well, Peter was a little bit of a hothead, and he was impetuous. He was in his feelings sometimes. So what does Jesus do? Jesus names him something that he isn't yet. Okay, now listen to me. Jesus names us what we aren't so we can eventually become what he believes we can be. And in the same way, he calls us to do that with others. That we speak what they aren't yet so that they can become it. Because words are powerful, all right? And you build or you tear down with this little thing right here called a tongue. You build or tear down. And when you speak life, it creates life. Speak what you want to see don't speak what you are seeing right now or what you already see. Speak what you believe in that person. And especially the closer that a relationship is, especially a romantic relationship, the most powerful words spoken are the words spoken by that other person into your life. And I realize this is not always the easiest thing to do. But you know what you do? You cover each other's weaknesses and when you do that, all who are involved become stronger. Do you understand that? When you're speaking words of life, when you're covering the weaknesses of the other person. You know, we just talked about this last week. You know, Jesus was betrayed in a garden. And the part of the story I didn't have time to tell last week is as the mob is coming, before the disciples cut and ran, remember we talked about that last week, okay, um, before that happened, the mob is closing in on Jesus. The disciples are there with Jesus. And, and so Peter, again, he's kind of in his feelings. He gets angry real quickly. Um, he has a small dagger of some sort on him. He's packing, okay? And, uh, and so what he does is he takes this, this like sword and he takes a swipe at one of the guys that is coming to arrest Jesus. And the Bible says that Peter misses, the guy must have dodged or whatever, and yet the, the sword cut the side of the man's head and actually cut his ear off. And at this point, Jesus looks at Peter and says, no, this is not how this is going to go down. We are not taking up arms. And Jesus reaches up to the man's head, the Bible says, and puts his hand over the man's ear and heals the ear. Heals the ear of the man that's coming to arrest him. All right, now listen. Peter did not need an attempted murder charge on his record. He didn't need it. And there were plenty of eyewitnesses there to see this go down. He was practically guilty. But what did Jesus do? Jesus eliminated the evidence. And this is so important. Because Peter would have been arrested also at this point for attempted murder, okay? Jesus eliminated the evidence. In relationships, we are called to cover each other's faults and wounds and shortcomings. 
See, most people now in our culture, we point out faults, right? We do this online all the time. We love to point out faults of other people. We love to expose other people. But Jesus actually covered. Jesus actually heals because love heals and love covers. Jesus covers the condemning evidence. So important. Now he says, I want you to do that with each other. Not just in romantic relationships, but friendships with other people. You know, Jesus said this. I don't have this verse on my my notes, but Jesus said this. He goes, they will know, who's they? Meaning those not of faith will know that you're my disciples by how you love each other. In other words, how you cover, how you heal how there's safety. There's safety in real love, by the way. And he asks us to do the same. We live in a culture that likes to cancel, likes to point out each other's faults. But can we be people instead who cover the faults of others? Lastly, the strength of your relationship is dependent upon the strength of your word. This is huge. And if I could preach this like nonstop in our culture right now, I think I would because something happened. It was there before COVID. Something happened after COVID. People have a I could give a rip attitude now when it comes to what they speak and their words lining up with their actions. It's like it's like nowadays it's like people people don't necessarily do what they say they're going to do. Now, that was there before COVID. Don't get me wrong. But it just seems like it's now like in spades. I don't know. But relationships are built upon the trustworthiness of our word. If, if you can't trust the words that are coming out of that other person's mouth, there is no relationship. Do you understand that? We have to trust each other and trust our words. So, will I be a promise maker and a promise keeper because it requires both i make promises and then i keep them see most of our society and i hate to even say it even people who go to church we're promise breakers we're promise makers and promise breakers not promise keepers we say oh i'll be there and then we don't show up oh oh, i'll do it and then we don't oh i'll commit and then we quit or, or I promise, and then I forget. It's all over the place. I mean, like, everywhere, every sector of our society, there's a low level of commitment. There's a high verbal, like, like promise, and then a low commitment. We're no longer people that the Bible would use this term, covenant. We're no longer covenant people, it seems like, in our nation. What's a covenant? A covenant feels like an old-fashioned, heavy word, right? Well, it just basically means this. It means no matter what. It means that what I say, I mean, and I will do. And there's a huge sickness, it seems like, impacting our relational health of covenant breakers. We live in a disposable world. The phone that you have right now in your pocket that you spent over $1,000 for over time, maybe, but you spent over 1000 bucks in about two to three years, you'll dispose of it and you'll get a new one. We are disposable people even of things that have value. And so covenant means what I say, I'll do. What I say, I'll do. God, by the way, is an excellent covenant keeper. He's amazing at it. Thank God. (laughs) You know, because we're many times not. But here's why he's great at at keeping covenant. He's great because He doesn't speak before he thinks. It's huge. Sometimes we just go, blah, and we're like, oh, I didn't think that through real well. Yeah, yeah. God thinks, and he calculates, and he ruminates in all the right ways before he enters into covenant. Second thing, he doesn't rush into covenant. He doesn't just say, I'm going to do it. It's not based upon just chemistry. He weighs out the commitment. Like, he didn't send his son Jesus on a whim. Hey, today, Jesus, why don't you go to earth and die? No. It was thought through. He knew the price. 
He knew what was going to go down. Thirdly, he doesn't allow feelings or emotions to determine the faithfulness to his word. So it's not based upon what I feel today. God doesn't wake up and go, well, first of all, he doesn't sleep. But let's just say he did. He doesn't wake up and he goes, ah, today I feel like loving Jeremy. And then the next day he wakes up, nah, I don't feel like it today. No. He is steadfast, steadfastly faithful to what he committed to. And you know what he wants? To the best of our ability, we're not going to be perfect, we're not going to be like God, but to the best of our ability, he wants us to do the same. You know, we, we will not be perfect, but we could ask a perfect God who's perfect at keeping covenant to help us be as perfect as we possibly can. Many years ago, um, over two decades ago actually, I had the privilege of doing a wedding ceremony in Ohio for two people that lived in Rockford. And the uh, bride was from Ohio, so we all traveled to Ohio and we, uh, we had a great celebration. I had the privilege of doing the wedding of um, two of Jen and my closest friends, um, uh, Sean and Jill Johnson, who are senior pastors at Red Rocks Church out in Denver, Colorado now. This is before Red Rocks started, before they planted it. They lived here in Rockford. They were part of our staff. And, um, and they were getting married, and we had an amazing marriage ceremony in Ohio. Fast forward now two decades, and the last few years have been kind of difficult, very difficult, not kind of, very difficult for Sean. Um, Sean has been very open about um, anxiety and things like that, but, but a lot of it revolves around the fact that he has been diagnosed with, with Parkinson's. And it's obviously been a very, very heavy, heavy journey, and one that Jen and I are just praying and trying to lift up their arms. And um, they've told their church about it. I'm not sharing anything that they've not already shared. In fact, I called them on Friday, and I go, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, buddy, I'm talking about you in my message on this weekend. And he's like, tell them whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, bar a miracle, the future is heavy for them. But this is what I've watched in the last few years since that diagnosis. What I've watched, and I've been able to have a front seat view as, as good friends, is I've watched them as a couple fight and come together. Not fight with each other, fight for each other. And I've watched that they have decided that they are going to fight for their marriage, they're going to fight for their kids, they're going to fight for their church, they are going to give it everything they got. If we were to all teleport over two decades back into the past to Ohio, when I stood between them and I said, Sean, do you take Jill to be your beautiful wife? And when I said, Jill, do you take Sean to be your amazing husband? When I did that ceremony, no one could have written the story that would come two decades later. None of us. But this is what they did. They came together because of chemistry. But they stayed together because of commitment. They stayed together because they said, no. We made a promise. Through thick and thin, through sickness and in health, till death do us part. You know what's interesting about chemistry? Is chemistry draws you together. Commitment keeps you together. But then the more that you're committed to one another, guess what happens? Your chemistry actually increases also. Like, Jen and I have great chemistry now. Better than what we were when we were young and in our early 20s getting married. Why? Because we've committed to one another. There's great chemistry. It's a, almost like this cyclical kind of thing, this circle, that the more that you commit, the more chemistry. The more chemistry, the more you commit. And you just keep on. Listen, it's... It's amazing. And back to Sean and Jill, I want to say what they have as a relationship is beautiful and it's hard and it's rewarding. And Jen and I are not just proud of them, we look up to them. 
we are honored to call them friends. See, we need to put God at the center of our relationship. We need to speak words of life over one another. We need to cover each other's faults and weaknesses. Not point out faults, cover them. And lastly, we need to be covenant people. Stay true to our word. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray for every couple right now, specifically. I pray that you would help us to take away something today that maybe we need to sharpen, we need to get a little better at. Maybe it's that you need to be more in the middle. Maybe we need to pray for one another. and we're, We feel awkward praying for our spouse or our boyfriend or girlfriend. We feel awkward about it. May, may today we take that step and, and pray. We don't have to sound like eloquent or a pastor. We don't have to sound like we have all the words together. You look at the attention of our hearts. So Lord God, I pray, help us to be prayerful people. Help us to be people that, that also, that we cover each other's faults, that we speak life Maybe, maybe our relationship has been characterized by negativity and criticism and sarcasm. God, I pray that we would speak life starting today. Most of all, may we be people of our word. May the other person be able to trust us fully. When we say we're going to do it, we do it. If we say we're not going to do it, we don't do it. May we be people of covenant. I also pray for friendships today. I pray for working relationships, best friend relationships at school, all of the different relationships. I pray, God, may we apply these principles. May we pray for our neighbor, our friend, our coworker. May we speak life at work and at school. May we cover each other's faults, and may we be people of our word. Thank you, God. We love you. We love you. One quick thing. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. The best relationship, the most important relationship you could have, and we give an opportunity for this almost every weekend, is the relationship with the one who died for you, Jesus Christ. He loves you. He cares for you. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Today, I want to make him the leader and the forgiver of my life. I want to ask for forgiveness for all I've done wrong. I believe he died for me so I could live, and I want him to lead my life. If that's you, it's not becoming a part of a church. You're not becoming a member right now or anything like that. You're just saying, I want to make Jesus the leader of my life. Go ahead and raise your hand and put it right back down. Anybody? Yes, yes. Hands have gone up. I guarantee you at every location. Lord, thank you for those people that raised their hands. And I pray that God today, you saw their hands. You see the intent of their heart. Can we all say this prayer together? Say this prayer, all of us together, whether we raised our hand or we didn't. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I believe you died for me. I want to live for you. Thank you for loving me with an unconditional love. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Come on, put your hands together.